Have you ever wondered what it's like to work in the fashion industry? To make it as an artist, the hustle behind launching your own label, pursuing a career in music or any other creative industry? Halfstack has been pursuing these stories in print form for the last four years. This fall, we're bringing the inside story to YouTube. We connected with some of Chicago's most iconic creatives to hear their stories and share their journeys with you. We take you behind the scenes and offer candid, personal conversations with people pursuing their dreams. It's not as glamorous as the media would like you to think. We are sharing the raw reality behind making it. The journey of an artist can be immensely gratifying and at once incredibly overwhelming. Many people who consider themselves creatives tend to be nonlinear thinkers with amazing imaginations and people who are incredibly introspective. They put their heart into and often bear their soul in the work that they do. It can be really scary to expose so much of oneself to critique and admiration. Being an artist is a struggle between the limelight and the depths of your studio. It's hard to build a life in a creative field, but when it's all you know, it is your lifeblood, your energy, and the one thing that can truly keep you going. In this episode of Making It, we meet another Chicago artist, CJ Hungerman. His energy and personality is at once captivating and engulfing. One not to shy away from his struggles throughout life and with addiction, his art is an open book to his personal narrative. Yet, despite the darkness that has been woven throughout his story, he finds a striking balance in bright colors that truly fill the viewer of his artwork with hope, happiness, and excitement. He is best known for his work known as Visual Riot. It is composed of pattern, kinetic, and colored chaos. The personal icons that he creates represent humans, human emotions, and their interaction. The layer shapes and color choices evolve into this amazing, electrified, surreal landscape that engages the viewers with these crazy optic riddles each and every time they look at his artwork. He works in an old studio space void of ventilation, windows, heat, or even air conditioning. Yet it is through this experience that he truly understands the extremes of his creative environment and how they have an impact on the direction of the art that he creates. The isolation and darkness of his studio has bound him to be as bright as possible throughout his work with harmony and dissonance often being constant companions. CJ is truly a renegade, inspiration, and an artist to know in Chicago. Keep watching for the full interview where he shares his journey, his struggles, and what motivates him to keep creating. I have a degree, uh, my first degree is in percussion, uh, music. I started playing music and drawing like at eight and, and really seriously at 12, 13. Yeah, so I have a degree in music, which yeah, probably lends itself to the rhythmical patterns uh, I still play. And a degree, a uh, Bachelor of Science in Graphic Design, a BFA in Painting, and an MFA in Painting. And then I taught. And there was nothing, nothing more satisfying than having kids at the university level and teaching them. I myself, as an artist, I have been I have been a professor and a designer, and all of those jobs did not pan out. So, over the last decade or two decades, I've been forced to be a real artist, <laughs> um, and within that, within the struggle of trying to find money for you know your family, for the house, I believe. And as, I'm, uh, as I go from painting to painting and trying to sell it or do public artworks to get money, because in Chicago I've done the Chinatown Library for the mayor and the city of Chicago. And the cool thing about that is, which I did not know in the beginning, <clears throat> a couple of people who were applying for it, you know, were some kind of top, top, top rank artists. Now my name is in with all the other um, public artists, like Picasso and Dubuffet, and you know, I didn't realize that fact till after. Anyway, so as I, as you struggle to get money to survive on, like every, every single artist does, um, my paintings evolve, I believe, you know, I paint for myself because that is the only way I can have them come out like that. So as the paintings don't sell or don't go anywhere or I don't get public art, I go to more the next level or more layers of how far you can push it until someone finally goes, there it is. You know, like the my favorite part in 
a movie, you know, the movie Picasso is when you just see the paint drip on it. He goes, oh, you know, and like I said before, you know, I'm a puzzle piece that fits somewhere. Everyone's in some kind of uh, old garage, old brick house or old crappy apartment. And everybody's struggling to get out. And I think as my artwork develops, the more and more rejections I get. Uh, and I think that is, that's the growth that I have is, and I don't want to say the pain of being an artist like a, but is if you are suffering more, I will push myself more hours and to experiment with more different things. This piece was done right after it and it looks a hundred times exponentially different than what was in it only two months previous. So I have this kind of, because I feel the pressure of, well, if that doesn't work what will work next and I, I'm pretty sure many artists must work like that if they don't have if you can't see uh, the next step like there's no insurance for me there's no 401k there's no savings you know and as if this is it then you got to do the best you can and be the best and be the number one because everybody else is going for the same thing and you hope that you're the one that can make it past that hump as I'm moving through or slithering through the art world of Chicago and throughout the, uh, the nation uh, you know, there's bumps, of course, and potholes and, and delays and people in your way. We, uh, you know, there's so many in the way people like why, well, you know, uh, why don't I get hired for this? And everybody, I think, thinks like that. Uh, that, for me, pushes the artwork as well as, you know, trying to provide not lose a house or you know, something like that. It is like a living animal, or like traffic. When you see the traffic hit the brakes, and it's doo -doo -doo -doo, <laughs> because what I what I have to do, and I'm pretty sure most of the artists that I'm friends with, every single avenue, because artwork, nobody wants to pay you, nobody wants to support you, and you know what's funny is when you look historically at societies, what do you look at first? Artwork and their music. But like we're on the the low, the lowest part, you know, shit rose downhill, we're the bucket. So what I do is, you know, you, you look at, can you get public artworks? Can you get government funding? Can you get grants? Can you apply for jobs at universities? Can you apply for jobs being a designer? So now, um, obviously we're in the city of Chicago, go Cubs. And uh, I am friends with the guy who owns Harry Carey's only because he, I had redid all the cows this year. So repaint, you, you look wherever you possibly can get money to be creative. So you don't feel stifled. I mean, it was, it's a blast to go out and, you know, redo stuff for people. And, uh, uh, you know, so wherever it is, you know, getting paid, getting a big paycheck for public artworks, man, that is, that is the, it, you you have to push yourself to be the best to write. You got to write the best. You have to have all of your resume in order. You know you can't get any kind of government public artwork unless all your T's are crossed. And uh, they don't care about your artwork until they see your application first. I was such a uh, lax days ago student, you know, drunk like all the other students, and you know, kind of just futzing my way through with C's and B's. You know, you get to graduate school and you got to get A's and stuff. But still. You know, you're a recluse, that's not real living. And I would like to go back to that. I'd like to go back to the not real world, but you know, in the university setting, you are protected by uh, the art department. You know, it's a very loving, you know, quote unquote, area and safe. And when you come out here, if you are only doing art, I don't have any other job, there's no support of any other money from anything, you have to figure out and find money wherever you can while you keep you know and i think that's what makes me more creative is you know that pressure of like and it's not like oh you gotta go pay like i come in like a factory job every single day 365 days christmas morning whatever because that's you know what i do what you have to do to get to get the public artworks job or the private artworks job or any you know uh, anything anything you could hook up with oh, you don't have a framework for artists. There's no kind of, if you do A and B, that equals C, there's nothing. There's no structure, there's no game to be played. It's absolutely good lighting and who you know. I mean, you know, you go pump gas. I mean, there's nothing, or you know, all, a lot of us, we've all, if you haven't worked at a restaurant, I was a sous chef for five years, kill me now. Are you kidding me? That was insane. And you know, th those are the kind of situations that pushes you to be like, I can't do this anymore. Uh, Oh, I have problems in my head. <laughs> um, all of all of this stems from a chaotic uh, 
I feel life that I am, have only myself to blame. <laughs> so, um, all through uh, um, my higher education, you know, you go through uh, how to draw, how, how to paint, how to, and it's very structured. And, you know, even when you're painting at the university, my paintings were completely different than this. When I finally decided to paint whatever I wanted for myself and use whatever colors I want and forget about any of the design qualities, it's not good to say to young, you know, you know, freshmen, but at this point in my life, I threw kind of the, the handbook that you're sort of given as a student and then higher education and a professor and just like, you know what, I'm going to do what I want because no one else, no one cares about what I'm doing now, so I might as well do what I want to do. The biggest inspiration for me is from all my friends that I know that do artwork and new friends that I meet. These, these people that I know today who do just phenomenal work, I, you know, I feed off of what they're doing and especially when you look, I mean, you've seen people do realistic or hyper-realism. Yeah, what is going... You're like, are you serious? Yeah. Like, and, you know, some, so some of their techniques, they show me. Now I can't do it as well as them. But I utilize, you know, if I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Like, little parts of my, like, this is taken from someone and this is from another buddy. He goes, oh, you should put patterns in there. Here's a place. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know. Um, but you, you know Chicago, which is, has to be my favorite town. I've been in many, many towns. And it's just, it's easy to get around in. And it's really a big, small town because every when you get in that art community, mm -hmm. the circle people, just mm -hmm. like we were talking about, mm -hmm. you know everybody, and it's real easy to get along. Uh, other, you know, you don't see this many colors except for in the graffiti, right? You know, so a lot of my friends who are graffiti friends, that's where the color palette comes from. And so, you know, these guys, when you see them with their spray cans, and like I use spray paint too, but not like these dudes, you're like, ha, 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 done, you know, and you're like, ah, you know, but, um, and, uh, and it's real cool. So, you know, I have a fascination with horror films and clowns and stuff, and it's very, this is like a circus. When you have to spend so much time in a studio like this, or any studio that just isn't isn't a nice, comfortable area, it becomes com like an asylum. Like, cause you go a little <laughs> crazy when you don't really, uh, you know, I communicate with people down in the city and get in the city at least once a month, and you're like, oh yeah, that's right, people, people are around. As I was a kid, you know, at eight, eight or nine or ten, you know, every kid starts drawing. I started playing drums. And about the age 13, you know, those were the things that I knew I wanted to do. But also at the age 13, you know, experimenting in drugs and alcohol started and never ended for probably 35 years. So in that situation, you know, everything's a bit of a cloud. And some things in my life I can't remember because of... You know, the friends that I hung out with, we all did the same thing. So there was no checks and balances. I played in the marching band and drum corps, and we did our work, and all of us drank together, and all of us smoked weed and did whatever. You know, acid was rampant in the 80s. We all did a bunch of acid and crank. It was a bizarre, it looked, it was a lot like growing up in the 70s, because I had older friends, obviously, and they, you know, so it was an odd time, you know, starting at that young age, and, you know, you flow with it. You go, you know, I was doing artwork all the way through high school. Uh, and uh, that's what my major in college started as percussion major in jazz music um, percussion and the whole time you know as I furthered my education so did the alcohol and drug abuse you know all the way up through master's school where I started to break down because of the you know years and years of, of abusing myself because I was a smoker you know also and uh, so then the downward spiral really started and as I left the university, I went to do graph design work uh, for trade shows in Chicago. And when you're doing that, you also drink with your clients. So I get fired from that job and I just go to working directly at a bar. Then artwork I wasn't even doing for a while, uh, just because it was just all about as much drugs as you could get. My wife wanted to kill me. Okay, that's all. She wanted to kill, 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 kill me. So at that point, you think that would be the lowest, but it wasn't. At a point, there was no job. I was just drinking in a bar. I was coming home maybe once or twice a week, just passing out on people's couches. as well. At a point, my wife goes, hey, either we're getting a divorce or you got to ratchet it together. So it took about two months for like shakes and you know to get all the crap out and I couldn't drink. I spent a month on my couch, couldn't move, and then, you know, re rehab. And after that, you know, me and my wife, we, we, uh, we She's the one that saved me from dying. 
artwork, no music still at this point, I become a sous chef. So a little bit of the alcohol and drugs filter back in. Luckily the chef became way worse than all of us. He left his wife, left his children, like left the business, left us unpaid. You know, we took all the equipment, we had to sell it to get paid. 2005, 2006, no job. Okay, so I haven't had a job since then. So I had to refocus, you know, I, I started put putzing around with black and white ink work. And the very first place I got my piece into was Beverly Art Center in Chicago. And I won a prize. Okay, and this is after probably six years of not doing artwork, forgetting all about, you know, the university, the things I wanted so much in life that I worked for and I screwed all up. So here I am, I start in this, reconvert this crap garage into my studio and I had one little small drawing desk. I just started drawing these black and white little amoeba things that represented like probably for me it was kind of these little shapes. It was like every sin that I've done or every beer that I drank, you know, just to keep me from going to the bar or keeping my head together. I apply for another uh, exhibition contest, right? I win again. So as this kind of, at being an addictive personality, I go, well, if I can win this, how many more can I win? You know, and it starts, keeps going, going. I get, uh, you know, a two-person show at Black Walnut Gallery and a couple other things. And, you know, my wife is encouraging me through this whole thing. So she goes, hey, are you ever going to do anything in color? And I said, listen, if I start doing color, I'll never go back to black and white. And then this stuff started. At that point, I start doing the color work and I filter into the, the, the Z brothers, Zal brothers, and I start doing some shows down there because, you know, those people are pretty well known. I meet Hebrew and uh, I just start talking to him about stuff and he starts telling me what he's doing and he's like 25 and I'm like, I gotta, you know, get my shit together, right? And so he was really the one when I saw him and what he was doing and he was so kind to talk to me um, whenever I wanted. And I decided, okay, well, I'm going to give it a shot. And so now, here we are, seven years later, where it's, you know, and I've gotten public artworks, things, I've got, you know, grants, I've won, you know, so we're just still, you know, I'm still pushing to get above a stability, I don't, right? You know, kind of a constant of a flow of artwork going out and money coming in. Hey, it's been a struggle, but I don't have a crazy boss. The pressure of feeding children and helping, you know, because my wife has a full-time job, helping uh, pay for a house that we almost lost three times. I mean, that was insanity, right? You know, almost going bankrupt has produced what we see here. And so I can do whatever I want. I don't have a boss or whatever. And so, you know, whatever crazy here goes on there, you either love it or you're going to hate it, you know, because, and that's fine because either, you know, some people just like, it's color. Just why is there so much color? And you know, it's it's like uh, the kitchen sink theory. Everything that I've learned about design and color theory was one of my favorites. You know, I've tried to apply in a backward ass sort of stuff. You, I don't know if you guys know who Terry Winters is. He's an artist from the '80s. He's not super famous, but he is. You know, he's a schizophrenic. And um, all he does is paintings of mushroom spores, right? So, he, but he'll do like one, and ah, ah, he'll do one over here, and it's so it's all this layer. That's where I, I got influenced for doing these layers uh, because it's it reminded me of like how we think, or how life is to you every day. You know, you don't know what's going to go on, and every layer is either good or bad, or good or bad. You have something that makes your eyes rest, something that kind of is discord, something that draws you back in and out. You know. And why I like making these and the people that I do sell them to, when you come to these paintings, and you kind of can get in different crap every day. And I, you know, these mean things to me personally. That doesn't have to be um, forever. I mean, everybody can bring what they want to it. But I like that people, you know, uh, and they kind of get exactly what I'm saying. Because I'm like, well, you know, whatever you think about it, you know, tell me. And they're almost always kind of right on. When you go in as an artist, I don't know if you people, uh, you guys, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> you people, I don't know if, uh, if you've worked, had to work, I worked with Wright Construction Company, just a bunch of really great guys, they're a company that takes care of all the buildings in Chicago, so like, so this artist is coming, so you need to, you know, do what he says, move your shit out of the way, and I'm like, oh, you didn't say that, did you? Like, you know, because that, as soon as you uh, walk in, I'm like, hey, I'm CJ, they all look at me like, 
So I'm like, listen, whatever you guys, I don't, I can move my stuff. I don't need. And two, ten minutes later, I'm laughing with these dudes. They're giving me uh, suit, forklifts. <laughs> like, hey, you need this? Just go because you know. I'm like, hey, I know you guys got a job to do, and I'm kind of stepping on your toes. You know, it pays to be humble. I've worked in construction before, and you know, they're like, now who's this? You know, these are the guys that have boots on the ground, right? They're the ones. Everybody can talk, 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 talk. I'll oh, design this, and then these are cats building it, and they're, they're the ones you got to give a lot of respect to. And uh, I had nothing but fun. It was the proudest um, moment, not only because um, now I have to give props where they are due, because I would never have gotten through it without this woman named Wendy Miller, and she is the public arts director in Chicago. Uh, she is like the Dalai Lama for artists. What an amazing human. I freaked out. She's like, you text me anytime. You know, I'm like, Wendy, I don't know. She's like, just breathe, live in the moment. I mean, she was like totally zen. And she was dealing not just with me. She's a public arts worker. So there was like 50 other idiot artists who probably like, eh, 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 you know, and she just was completely, I mean, an amazing woman. One of the best people I've ever met in my life. It couldn't have been cooler. You know, I took, you know, all the stuff that I do. So since the piece was about uh, immigrating, the images I use are these little random robots. They're just the kind of like these concave pieces, and, but it shows movement. And so what we did is they told me stories of what they would carry over for luck or, you know, and it was these weird little coins that they would carry with them that had their, their family name on it. Them telling me personal, personal stories. You know, we used the lotus flower and uh, plum blossom and um, a couple of uh, astronomical symbols within the piece because that represented you know the struggles apparently they um, first were in the north side and then the irish kicked them out of there and then the italians kicked them out of wherever so you know and this was the red light district apparently uh, back before chinatown i mean and it's beautiful you, i mean they cleaned everything up everything is just you know in its place and you know they were tell they tell, still talk i talked to young people 18 year olds about the struggle of being a chinese person in chicago and i was um, not only happy, but humbled, you know, I'm not Chinese, but they picked me to do the work. So it was my pleasure to learn as much as I possibly could to hybrid my style with, you know, what their community represents. That was probably the proudest, the coolest thing I've done so far. No one, no one wants to pay us. Even if you're the best of the best in, you know, video, whatever it is, or whatever the multi, you know, because we see people do installations. I mean, you don't get paid for that because it's an installation, but we're using the coolest technology and we are still starving and you have to be the best. I believe that if you're an artist, if you're in theater, if you're a musician, you ha you're going to be screwed. You're going to have to be the best of the best of the best to, to move forward, to be able to, you know, uh, pay the bills. And you're, you know, uh, I don't think it's about trickery at all or selling out. I mean, sell out, please, sell out. You know, whatever. If and I'll go back to Hebrew again. The flyboy, I would paint that stupid thing a thousand times over anywhere. If someone wants to pay me to do this skull over and over again, please bring it on. You know, because that is how you make money to do whatever you want. Is if someone latches on to something they dig about you. Absolutely. You gotta figure out which one to get. And if you can't get that one, get out and hike your boat to the next one. You know, the one over. Because it's a pain, uh, I think, for any artist. You know, no one, uh, I don't want to say no one respects us, but no one really cares. No one wants to give artists or theater or music money, as we see now the STEM, you know, mathematics and science, which is absolutely understandable. But for us, I mean, what we're selling is luxury. What I like is when you see fashion, like, because I've, uh, there's websites like VIDIA or whatever. It's, you know, they want to put your stuff on scarves. And I'm like, yeah, please, here's my crap. You want to sell it? You know, I mean, uh, because I think that is a great hybrid. You know, whatever we can put original art on, again. So I'm working with these people called Indie Walls out of New York. And I'm hopefully doing a bunch of big uh, murals for a new uh, hotel in Brooklyn, right? These guys, if you've ever wondered, well, how the hell do they get artwork in hotels that are original? These are the cats, you know? And that's, you know, if you find venues like that, these dudes, because they only get paid if we get paid. And that's who you want to look for. Uh, as as you do your artwork, so you just do your thing, and you find these people that want to sell you you doing your thing, which is uh, difficult. But once you start to look around, there's people, and it's, again, finding where your puzzle piece fits. Yeah. 
uh, whatever you can find, uh, and I hate, I hate, hate, hate to quote Lars, Lars Ulrich from Metallica, but he said, yeah, we sell out, we've sold out at every seat in the stadium. And that's exactly what you want to do. If you can make money uh, doing it, make it whatever way you can. If you feel like you're compromising yourself, then you are. So don't do that if it makes you feel bad.